Thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk to you about uh, some of the work that we've been doing on uh, HIV latency, specifically looking at establishment uh, and reversal. And as John was saying, that is actually a, a little bit of just about everything you've heard so far today. Um, some of the things that we're talking about um, is uh, the persistence of HIV infection under ART, as we know, is due to a reservoir of lately infected cells that remain indefinitely despite full therapeutic suppression of viral, viral replication. Uh, as uh, uh, John was actually introducing earlier, uh, very nicely, HIV latency is triggered by several mechanisms that lead to the silencing of virus expression, including epigenetic DNA modification through methylation and histone deacetylation, a limited availability of critical transcription factors like uh, NFAT, and the inefficient elongation of the nascent viral transcripts. And so understanding the mechanisms responsible for the establishment, maintenance, and reversal of the HIV reservoir under ART is essential in order to help us develop novel approaches to HIV eradication. So we have heard a bit about the different types of reservoirs. Um, Mario Stevenson was talking about the, the macrophage reservoir, and we have t heard about the T cell reservoir, and that the CD4 T cell reservoir is the best characterized latent reservoir in vivo. At the anatomical level, level we can find uh, the latent uh, CD4 T cell populations in the periphery, as well as in lymph node, gut, and bone marrow. But the cellular level, uh, the CD4 T cell compartment is actually a heterogeneous population that has a number of different uh, phenotypes, depending on the subset that you're looking at, that could help uh, uh, contribute to different mechanisms of the establishment of latency or else um, reflect different activities when it comes to trying to reverse latency or even contribute to some of the, the spontaneous viral rebound that we see in some of the studies that have been discussed earlier. So in the uh, memory CD4 T cell compartment, the essential memory, transitional memory, and effector memory populations have all been shown to, uh, to contain the latent reservoir in vivo. As well as in the effector memory compartment, uh, we have uh, subsets like TH17s, Tregs, and T follicular helper cells that all been shown to contain uh, uh, integrated HIV DNA as well as um, reactivatable virus from these different compartments. Now, eradication strategies to target uh, HIV in all these different subsets will really need to help address the heterogeneity of this complex population that harbors the latent reservoir. And that's one of the challenges we have when we're th talking about different uh, mechanisms, whether you're thinking about uh, a shock and kill approach or even uh, the block and lock mechanisms of looking at suppression, um, how are you going to control um, viral expression in different subsets that have different activation states or different cell cycling or different expression of different transcription factors. And so our studies really are trying to combine uh, uh, different uh, mechanisms of so looking at an in vitro model uh, as well as different um, ex vivo assays uh, to help us quantify the reservoir and studying uh, patient samples that we can combine to help us understand mechanisms of, of persistence. And then in working with collaboration um, with different uh, groups, we would evaluate different therapeutic interventions which would hope hopefully lead to a cure, whether it's a, a remission kind of a cure as, uh, as Steve Deeks was talking about earlier or an eradication. Uh, approach. And so our studies, as I was mentioning, um, employ this combination of ex vivo and in vitro approaches to study mechanisms of HIV latency. And we have developed uh, an in vitro model, a primary cell ba based in vitro model of latency called LARA that I'll be talking about uh, a little bit later. But we also have um, studies using ex vivo patient samples from two different cohorts, um, the SCOPE cohort, which is in collaboration with Steve Deeks, as well as a uh, cohort of individuals uh, that are uh, from here in Florida. These are all virally suppressed um, HIV-infected individuals. And so we've been using uh, these, study these uh, ex vivo patient samples to help us characterize uh, the reservoir in different CD4 T cell sub uh, subsets. And so from these ex vivo uh, samples, we looked at the frequency of the central memory, transitional memory, and effector memory populations. And we see, uh, similar to what has been um, reported earlier by Nicolas Chamont and other groups, that the central memory population uh, subset really comprises the majority of the cells that are in the, me the memory subset compartment. But when we look at the frequency of cells that are carrying integrated HIV DNA uh, using a PCR-based approach, we see that as the effector memory population has the highest frequency of the uh, proviral DNA. Now, as Bob Silicano was talking about earlier, we know through this type of approach that we cannot distinguish between defective provirus versus uh, um, 
uh, intact provirus, we can just tell you that the frequency is higher in the effective memory subset. So in order to help us understand a little bit better about um, what the nature of the, uh, this provirus is in the effective memory population, we used an assay that we had developed previously called TILDA. And this assay allows us to quantify the frequency of the inducible reservoir. So it's a, a surrogate measurement for um, uh, potentially virally replica uh, replication competent virus by looking at uh, total CD4 T cells from uh, ex vivo uh, patient samples that we then divide in, into uh, a PMA inomycin stimulation or an unstimulated group that are then plated in uh, limiting dilution. These cells are then, um, after activation, we, we quantify using a QRT-PCR approach to look at the frequency of multi-spliced HIV RNA. And then, uh, based on the maximum likelihood method, we can calculate the frequency of cells with the inducible reservoir. And when we performed these experiments, we again, we saw, and this was performed on sorted CD4 T cell subsets, we saw the effector memory population had a significantly higher inducible reservoir, as well as having a significantly higher uh, frequency of latently, of provirally uh, carrying, cells carrying integrated provirus. And so then we also quantified the contribution of each uh, uh, CD4 T cell subset towards the inducible reservoir, and we see that it's the effector memory population which contributes over half of the signal that we see when we're looking at the latency reservoir, the latent re latency reversal. So we know that the, the uh, effector memory population has a high efficiency of latency reversal, but what about the quiescent CD, uh, TCM? So the central memory uh, compartment is uh, characterized as by having um, a lower level of transcription, a more quiescent phenotype. So as part of what we're seeing here, um, related to the uh, ability of these cells to respond to different stimuli and then turn on uh, uh, HIV gene expression. So we also used a transcriptional profiling approach and where we uh, again sorted uh, CD4 T cell subsets from our, uh, from our cohort and then we exposed these subsets to different stimuli. stimuli. Um, in this case, we used uh, bryostatin or PMA inomycin. And then we did transcriptomics, and we identified different signaling pathways that were upregulated in response to these stimuli in the central memory compartment. And we see that when you have, and then we correlated this with latency reversal. And what is associated with latency reversal in the central memory compartment is upregulation of signaling pathways that you may expect, where, where you see now induction of NFAT or uh, NF kappa B, so we, those transcription factors that John Kahn was talking about earlier. But we also see upregulation of uh, effector uh, responses. So these cells become more effector like or more effector memory like, looking more like the effector memory subset, the more stimulated or the more latency reversal we see. We also see down regulation of targets of like FOXO1. FOXO1 is something that drives, uh, or should say, uh, stops differentiation. So by releasing differentiation, allowing the, the central memory cells to progress into an effector memory seat, uh, phenotype, we allow latency reversal to continue. And this is evidenced here, but when we look at, um, we make a comparison of the central memory compartment that is um, untreated, versus the effector memory compartment that is untreated. And we look at transcriptional profiles in effector function genes, cell cycling, uh, TGF beta signaling, and apoptosis. And we see the central memory and effector memory compartments look very different. However, when we expose the central memory compartment to um, uh, bryostatin, a latency reversing agent, we see now this gene profile more closely resembles the, even the unstimulated or untreated effector memory compartment um, giving uh, support to the idea that the central memory, so differentiation of the central memory compartment into an effector-like uh, subset would allow the expression of um, uh, HIV that uh, also correlates with the gain of effector function as well as now progressing through uh, a uh, cell cycle. And so then to go back to uh, another topic that John was introducing was talking about the epigenetic modifications that correlate with the inducible reservoir. What we did was we looked at um, a number of different markers of um, epigenetic modifications. Um, uh, so uh, histone acetylation uh, and um, uh, epigenetic silencing. And so what we see, and then we also looked at, so on the top here is the central memory versus effector memory subset. And then we looked at the uh, correlation with the inducible reservoir. 
And we see here where we have a change in the epigenetic uh, signaling pathways also correlates with the inducible reservoir, which is mostly overlaying with the effector memory uh, uh, subset. And when we, have a, when we have a central memory compartment that actually upregulates or looks more like an effector memory compartment, we have a higher um, inducible reservoir. So all of these data combined are letting us know that differentiation of the central memory compartment is really what is driving uh, uh, latency reversal. But we really wanted to understand was now when we can take different latency reversing agents, what does that do to these different subsets? And how can we expect the efficacy of these different classes of agents to work on these different compartments? And for that, we used our an in vitro uh, latency model, which allowed us to, sh to look at a much higher frequency of infected cells versus the ex vivo reservoir from patient samples. And here we're using a, a primary cell-based model where we look at, we infect with a, a replication competent clone 89.6. We establish uh, infection in vitro um, using uh, just buffy coats from HIV naive donors. And then we establish uh, latency using a combination of uh, cytokines like TGF-beta and IL-7, which would help support longevity as well as TGF-beta is known to induce quiescence in a number of different cell types, um, specifically looking at the uh, suppression of um, transcription pa pathways that are associated with um, the establishment of HIV latency. And this model takes about two weeks to generate a population of cells that are uh, latently uh, infected that we can then use different latency reversing agents on to characterize how these different subsets respond uh, to these, these compounds. And these data here are just to show you some of the validation studies we, we performed to show that the different compartments that we are interested in, the central memory, transitional memory, effector memory cells were all present. This is just a uh, representation flow plot looking at two of the markers we use to characterize these subsets to show that we have all of these compartments represented. And then this uh, graph here is to tell you that each of these subsets is in fact infected. And so when we start to look at um, latency reversing agents, we know we can at least see um, that these cells are carrying integrated HIV DNA and should uh, respond to a drug if, um, if treated. So here's a com compilation of a number of different experiments we did using this, uh, this assay. This is the response of using uh, CD3, CD28 on total memory CD4 T cells. So we see a nice robust response. Um, and when we look at the different uh, subsets, we see again that the effector memory population has a significant increase in, um, in latency reversal over the central memory compartment. And this is even in our latency model. We applied different uh, latency reversing agents, different classes of latency reversing agents to help us understand how the different compartments were responding to them. And you can see them in the bar graph, but I think it's actually more interesting to look at these representation flow plots. Because what we're seeing here, this is uh, the gray is representing a background population of central memory in the upper quadrant the transitional memory in the lower, and then the effector memory down here. And then the purple dots represent the GAG positive cells represent, uh, present within each population. And you, as you can see, this is our unstimulated control where there's just a few dots here and there. But then now when we add in a, a stimulation like CD3, CD28, you see a lot of the cells are now ending up down into the effector memory population, although there are GAG positive cells everywhere. You can see that it's actually pushing these cells down into the effector memory population. We see a very high, um, uh, latency reversal efficiency. And now when we add in drugs like a PKC agonist like bryostatin, we can see the GAG positive cells are kind of all over the place, and you can see that in the, on the bar graphs as well. But what's interesting is then when we start to look at uh, drugs like HDAC inhibitors like um, Saha, Panabitostat, or, or Bromodepsin, we see kind of the cells are actually uh, not all over the place, but we see kind of a, a populations of cells in the central memory compartment that look like they're responding better to these HDAC inhibitors overall than you would see in the effector memory population. And then when we look at a compound like IL-15, we see that we have a high level of latency reversal efficiency in the effector memory population. And so when we, when we took all of these drugs come together and then we asked what is the full increase in, uh, in the change of latency reversal associated with also a change in the subset distribution, we see that driving the cells into effector memory subset gets you the best latency reversal and we see a negative correlation with um, cells in the compartments with the, in the central memory or transitional memory. And so together with our ex vivo data, these support the acquisition of a effector phenotype correlates with HIV expression and latency reversal in quiescent subsets like the central memory compartment. 
and that our LARA model is an effective tool for studying these mechanisms of HIV latency. And so because we are also interested in other mechanisms besides latency reversal, we want to look at establishment of latency. We've done a few experiments that I want to show you where we looked at cytokines or cellular interactions that can mediate HIV latency. And so one of the cytokines we're very interested in is TGF-beta. So what we did was we took the LARA assay and we did increasing concentrations or exposed the cells to increasing concentrations of TGF-beta. And then we asked what happens to the frequency of cells that are, in late, are infected or carrying integrated HIV DNA. And we can see that um, these cells now with increasing concentrations of TGF-beta, we see increasing um, uh, frequency of integrated HIV DNA. This is not attributed to uh, prolifer proliferation of these cells as when we look at absolute cell numbers, increasing concentrations of TGF-beta doesn't get you more cells, which makes sense. It actually um, uh, suppresses proliferation. And, but this is also not due to cell death as all the cells are equally viable in all these different concentrations. So, and then when we take the cells off TGF-beta and ask, can we reverse latency in these cells, we actually see the exact same profile that you see here when we look at two different doses of anti-CD3, CD28, we see an increase in HIV gag expression. So it seems that when we, what this is suggesting is that the TGF-beta is helping to promote the survival of infected cells in our model, and this may help con uh, contribute to HIV latency in vivo. One of the other things that I will uh, mention quickly is we're very interested in um, looking at other mechanisms of suppression and related to the control of CD8 T cells that is a non-cytolytic mechanism. And so this is a, um, a figure from a recent review where um, we're, we're specifically looking at the suppression of um, HIV expression in CD4 T cells um, through CD8 T cells. And again, we're using our in vitro model of latency, but we're instead of focusing on the latency reversal aspect of it, we're looking at the establishment of HIV latency. And for these experiments, what we do is we take a Buffy coat from an HIV negative donor, we enrich the CD4 T cells and we just rest them for three days, and then the other arm we take from the same donor CD8 T cells that we activate for three days. And then we establish an infection uh, in, in vitro using our 89.6 clone. We let the sit cells sit for about six hours and then we put them together at different ratios. And what we ask is what happens to, and I should say, um, when we put the cells together in different ratios, um, we let them uh, sit for th three additional days in the presence of IL-2 with sequinavir. So we're not looking at ongoing bioreplication. What we're doing is we're just seeing once the virus gets in and starts to express, what do we see in the presence of CD8 T cells? We, met, we monitor that by looking at gag expression, and we also look at the frequency of cells carrying integrated HIV D DNA by qPCR. Now we expect, because we're adding sequinavir immediately after infection, that we're not getting an accumulation of mutations, so what we expect to see is either, this, either the virus is turning on or it's turning off. And here's just a representative flow plot of one of the experiments we did where we saw the CD4 T cells alone have some gag expressing cells. If you just let them go, you've got a certain percentage of cells that'll just turn on um, HIV expression. But now what we see when we add in um, CD8 T cells, we see a decreased frequency of gag expressing cells. And we did this 12 times now, and this is significant when we see um, between a one to one or a one to five ratio, a de decrease in gag expressing cells. We looked in different, uh, uh, again, in the central memory, transitional memory, effector memory compartments to see whether or not was this a particular subset that was responding, and they all look pretty equal. And these are some TISNI plots to show you where the gag expressing cells are relative to the central memory or transitional memory, effector memory compartments. They all look pretty, the, pretty similar between the CD4 monoculture and the CD8 co-cultures. Um, we didn't see a change in the distribution of gag expressing cells. They are sporadic wherever you look. We also then looked to see whether or not this was a result of a change in the infection frequency of the CD8 T cell co-cultures and using a paired T-test we saw no significant change in the uh, frequency of infected cells, but we did see it, uh, frequent, a change in the frequency of gag expressing cells. So these data suggest that our CD8 T cells are playing a role in the establishment of HIV latency that we are currently investigating further. And uh, we'll be uh, having a talk at CROI um, that will be uh, showing these, uh, more of these experiments further. So in conclusion, we have demonstrated that memory CD4 T cell subsets constitute a dynamic reservoir of latently infected cells. The effector memory subset shows the highest frequency of the inducible reservoir in a cohort of virally suppressed HIV infected individuals. 
And the central memory subset differ differentiation to an effector phenotype is correlated with latency reversal. Our Lara in vitro model supports these conclusions and offers a platform for more in-depth mechanistic studies that we've then ex now expanded to characterize the contexts that are important for the establishment and maintenance of HIV latency in order to aid, aid in the development of therapeutic um, interventions. And with that, um, I, I need to acknowledge the people in my lab who are working on this, Abigail Willemsa, Jack Yoon. This is done, work is done in collaboration with uh, Guido Silvestri at Emory, as well as Rafiq Sekali, Susan Ribeiro, and Arthi Tala did a lot of the bioinformatics work. Um, we have um, funding from uh, Dari Hazuda for the development of the LARA assay, uh, Steve Deeks, obviously, with the uh, SCOPE cohort, and our funding agencies, our recent R01 um, for the CD8 studies. And also, of course, I need to acknowledge uh, that all the donors who give generously for us to do these studies. And with that, thank you for your attention.